2020, Greenwood School District 50 wanted to rename a school after Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. And this led to a neat idea. Why not have students interview Reverend Chris Thomas at the Mays Historical Site so that we can all learn more about this local civil rights pioneer? So Dr. Mays said that uh, he came out of his mother's womb kicking against Southern segregation. And, uh, and this was really Mays' legacy. His legacy was he's considered the principal founder of the civil rights movement, that most of what we know that, that became and shaped into the civil rights movement uh, came from the mind and the pen and the preaching of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. Where exactly was Dr. Mays himself born? not just in Greenwood, but what building? So Dr. Mays was born in, in Epworth. Uh, if you went today down Highway 178, you'll see a gray historical marker there uh, that says that this is where the home of Dr. Mays was. It's about 14 miles from my current location here at the Gleams Dr. Benjamin E. Mays Historical Preservation Site. I'm sitting on the porch of the house that Dr. Mays was born in, and this house once sat about 14 miles from here, right on Highway 178 going towards Saluda. What did Dr. Mays and his family eat when he was younger and how did they make it? So Dr. Mays and his family were a sharecropping family like most families in Epworth. Uh, and typically they would have eaten, you know, chickens and hogs were a big part of their diets. Eggs were, were a big part of their diet. Uh, and they, you know, grew staple things like corn, uh, okra, uh, those kinds of things would have been a large part of the diet uh, of, of African Americans in Epworth at that time. How did Dr. Mays travel when he traveled? So Dr. Mays traveled in many ways. He traveled by train, uh, he traveled by airplane, he traveled by ship. Uh, and so Dr. Mays, when he leaves Greenwood County to go down to the Bethany Colored School in McCormick, he takes the train there. When he goes to uh, off to high school at the South Carolina State High School Department uh, down in Orangeburg, he takes the train there. But uh, in the 1930s and 40s, Dr. Mays travels the world and uh, he, he boards the Queen Mary in 1936 uh, to go to Mysore, India, when he goes to the YMCA conference there. Uh, and in the 1960s, he traveled uh, twice on the uh, Air Force One. So he, in, in 1963, he's the official United States representative to the funeral of Pope John the 23rd, and he travels with then Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson on Air Force One. So uh, Dr. Mays traveled in, in many different ways. Did Dr. Mays' teachers or teachers ever teach him past his grade level? So Dr. Mays, uh, when he enters the Brick House School at age six, for a small country school, Dr. Mays was certainly very much ahead of the curve. His sister Susie, uh, we don't have any evidence that Susie, she was the oldest child in the family, and we don't have any evidence that she ever had any formal education. But she teaches Dr. Mays, uh, young Benny at the time, of course, to read and to write, to do some basic arithmetic, to write a small sentence. And so when he comes to the, to the Brick House School, he was immediately a very good student. Uh, his teacher, Mrs. Waller, really tried to help him to sort of advance very quickly. She recognized in Dr. Mays very early how talented he was. But uh, because Dr. Mays is only able to go to school in November, December, January, and February, just during the winter time, uh, when he could not be working in the fields, when he gets to high school at South Carolina State High School Department, he's almost 18 years of age. He leaves in June. On August the 1st, he would have turned 18 that year when he goes to high school. He's the age that kids should be finishing high school. And Dr. Mays is only ready to enter the eighth grade when he tests uh, to be placed in the high school. He wasn't even ready to enter high school. So at that time, Dr. May certainly wasn't ready to study above his grade level. Uh, he really spends a large part of his the remedial year, his eighth grade year there, and his first year of high school trying to catch up. Uh, but Dr. Mays was a very bright student. Uh, he finally makes the decision to stay at high school full time and to not come back like he does his first two years. His first two years of high school, he only goes November, December, January, and February and comes back home to work on the farm. His third year, which was really was his second year of high school, he makes the decision to stay at high school against his father's wishes. And uh, this allows Dr. Mays to really sort of catch up uh, and, and gain some traction that he'd lost. You know, he said he regretted those lost years of his life, the years that he could not be in school full time. But from that point on, I think that Dr. Mays was uh, at grade level or ahead. Uh, and I think that his, his, his uh, teachers and his faculty there at, at college really challenged him uh, to live up to his potential. What subjects did Dr. Mays get his degrees in? And how many degrees did he get total in his life? So Dr. Mays, uh graduates his first degree, his college degree was from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, his Bachelor's of Arts degree. Uh, he then goes on uh, to get a uh, 
master's degree from the University of Chicago and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. May's degrees were all in religious studies and in religion he was a New Testament scholar and uh, all of Dr. May's degrees were in religion. Dr. May's also goes on to be awarded 56 honorary doctorate degrees from institutions all over the country and uh, for many many years he had more honorary doctorate degrees than anybody else uh, in the history of the United States. Uh, of course he gets one in 1974 from Lander University and uh, Dr. May said that uh, he was most proud of that degree. He said he had uh, some 35 of those degrees at the time uh, at home and he said he was most proud of that one because it was the degree that uh, from the college that was in the university or the university or college that was in the county of his birth that would have not even allowed him to have admissions to their school when he was trying to go to school and now that school was honoring him with their highest award and uh, it meant a lot to Dr. Mays when he received his, doc his, his honorary doctorate degree from Lander University. Did Dr. Mays ever regret going to school rather than being a farmer? I don't know of Dr. Mays ever having any regret about uh, his path to go to school. In fact, uh, it was the highest source of motivation for Dr. Mays uh, when he was a young person. There were many obstacles that should have stopped Dr. Mays from not pursuing his, his desire and his dream to get an education. And so Dr. Mays was very motivated and committed to getting an education. He didn't quite know what he wanted to do when he was a young person, but he knew that if he can get an education, it would be an equalizer for him uh, in his life and his society and pursuit. Uh, Dr. Mays said he was never though offended by his life on the farm. Uh, he loved farm life. Uh, he was a very good field hand. Uh, and when Dr. Mays was older and he writes his autobiography in the 1970s, he said that he still, at his old age, loved to see the sight of corn blowing in the wind. So Dr. Mays, although he spent the majority of his adult life living uh, in large metropolitan cities in uh, Atlanta, and of course, and in Washington, D.C., uh, he always loved and was very respectful and honorable of his life on the farm in Epworth. What started the idea for Dr. Mays to talk to a lot of people and like in groups and stuff about equality and peace? And, and if you know the answer, like what really did they think about it? Uh, Dr. Mays was both influenced and, and hurt in some ways by the events of the Phoenix riots. Uh, it was a race riot that, that started on election day of 1898 and uh, it spread terror throughout the community for many, many days, and, and eight African Americans were lynched here in Greenwood County. And on that second day of the, of the riot, uh, the day that the lynchings began, uh, Dr. Mays was ter and his family were terrorized by a mob who rode into Epworth, and he said that they cursed his father, and they uh, forced him to get down and stand up and salute to them and take off his hat and salute to them several times. And the mob rode away, and Dr. Mays said in his autobiography, so that mob was his earliest memory in life, and he had never, ever forgotten that mob. And that sort of encouraged Mays to spend the entirety of his life working to end Southern segregation. Uh, he felt that the system robbed Negroes of their humanity and their dignity, and he thought that no man or no woman should be forced to live under such an inhumane system. And uh, during his tenure as the president of Morehouse College from 1940 to 1967, he encourages an army of young men, literally, that uh, went about the business of, of really attacking and ending the system that Dr. Mays had so long sought to and desired to end. And of course, the greatest champion of that cause, I believe, was Dr. King. How did Dr. Mays and um, Martin Luther King meet? Like, and what did he say, Dr. Mays say, to motivate uh, Dr. King? So Martin and, and, and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Dr. Mays met for the first time in August of 1944. Uh, Dr. King was a part of Dr. Mays' early admissions program where he brought uh, a group of, of 14 and 15 year olds that were leaving high school early to come to Morehouse. He was trying to replace the students he had lost who had gone off to war or had to go home because of World War II. And so uh, Dr. King comes to Morehouse then. Uh, Mays really influenced him because uh, Martin had grown up in the, a family uh, of preachers. His father was a preacher. His father and grandfather, Dr. Kings, were, were both graduates of Morehouse College, so Dr. Mays had actually known his father prior to, to Dr. King coming to Morehouse. And uh, Mays really influenced him through his, his Tuesday sermons that he would preach at chapel. Uh, King saw in Dr. Mays what I think he had always wanted, and that was if he was going to be a, a, a minister or a preacher, he wanted to be an intellectual preacher and one who left an impact upon the world around him. And he saw that in Dr. Mays. And it really made Dr. King want to follow Dr. Mays. And, and in many ways, Mays becomes his example of what King 
aspired to be, and ultimately in many ways what he became as, as an intellectual, as a thinker, and as one who defended the highest integrity of what he, how he viewed American society. Uh, he really received that from Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays believed uh, in, in the greatness and the goodness of America and that America should seek to live out its promise to all of its citizens, particularly the Negroes, citizens of that time. And uh, in Dr. King's preaching and, and his message, he really adopts that from Dr. Mays. And so Dr. Mays influenced him in, in many ways, but uh, in, in that way particularly. What made Martin Luther King and Dr. Mays have such a great bond? So uh, Dr. Mays and Martin, I, I think their bond was predicated on uh, Martin taking a very serious interest in Dr. Mays and being uh, interested in the things that Mays was interested in. And certainly one of those things that Mays was interested in was the whole civil rights uh, issue and his civil rights concerns. Um, and, you know, Mays had intellectual interests as a clergyman and as a preacher. Uh, one of those interests was God himself. And uh, Dr. Mays' dissertation for his, his doctoral thesis uh, was God is, the Negro God is reflected in his literature. And uh, Dr. King writes a very similar doctoral thesis or at least topic. And so they shared that idea of wanting to understand God through human expressions and, uh, and particularly cultural expressions that are related to, to, to the Negro people. And so I, I think they just had a very kin, kinship bond. They had similar interests, uh, similar intellect, uh, similar desires and pursuits in life. And I think that they just sort of came together and created a bond between the two of them. How long did Dr. Mays know Martin Luther King? So Dr. Mays met Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in, the, in August of 1944, and he knew him up until his death in, in 1968 uh, when he was assassinated. So he knew him from 1944 to 1968, and uh, he was a, a mentor and, and really almost like a father to, to, to King. Why did Dr. Mays love Martin so much? So I think early on when King comes to, to Morehouse, uh, King takes a very serious interest uh, in Dr. Mays. Uh, he was very impressed with Mays. And because of that, he begins to come to Dr. Mays' office and talk to him about his sermons that he would deliver. Uh, Dr. Mays preached every Tuesday at chapel at Morehouse and King uh, was always there. We have a picture of him in the museum sitting uh, right on the front row in chapel as, as Dr. King delivered one of his chapel sermons. And so these sermons really motivated King, they inspired him, and he would often go to Dr. Mays' office. And if Dr. Mays didn't have a faculty member or some business in his office, the two of them would oftentimes sit and talk and discuss what uh, Dr. Mays had just talked about. And I think that, that Dr. King saw uh, a tremendous amount of talent in, uh, in Dr. King, and uh, he wanted to help to develop and to hone that talent in. And I think in some ways, uh, there was a part of King that was very much like Dr. Mays. And so I think uh, he saw that in King, and it made him have a great uh, desire to assist King and a great affection for him. My question is, was Dr. Mays at Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech? If so, what did he do? So Dr. Mays was at the I Have a Dream speech, uh, and Dr. Mays was the benediction. He gave the benediction prayer, uh, and primarily he asked God to uh, place the benediction or the blessing upon this country, upon the nation. Of course, he asked for, for God's blessing upon the then President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and uh, Mays really just asked for God's divine blessing upon the nation as he ended the, the March on Washington. My question I have today, after learning a lot about Dr. Mays these past years, is where did Dr. Mays and his wife Sadie live while they lived in Atlanta? So uh, Dr. Mays and, and Mrs. Mays, uh, so Dr. Mays' wife, she would have lived her whole time in Atlanta in the presidential residence on Morehouse's campus. Uh, but of course she passes away before Dr. Mays moves off of campus and uh, from that point on Dr. Mays was widowed and uh, Dr. Mays would move into a home uh, that was there in, in, in East Atlanta and that's where he would live up until the time of, of his death. But for the majority of that time from 1940 until, 19, or to, until 1972 he lived in the presidential residence at Morehouse's camp, on Morehouse's campus and then he moves to a, a, another residence that he lived in uh, from 1972 until he dies in 1984. I want to know, how did Dr. Mays die? And how old was he when he died? 
So Dr. Mays uh, dies in March of 1984. Uh, he was a few months shy of his 90th birthday if Dr. Mays would have lived to August 1st of that year. Uh, Dr. Mays would have been 90 years of age, so he dies at, at 89. And he really just died uh, of old age, just uh, of, of what we would call natural causes. Uh, he begins to sort of slow down and diminish uh, toward the latter part of his life. And uh, Dr. Mays ends up dying peacefully in, in his old age. So uh, Dr. May spent uh, the majority of his life inspiring students to uh, achieve the, the, the greatest possible uh, for their gifts and talents and possibilities for themselves in life. He taught students that whatever was possible under the sun, that he wanted them to pursue that. And so I think that, uh, I, I hope that the students at the new Dr. Benjamin E. Mays uh, elementary school will, will grasp that spirit in Dr. Mays to shoot for the star, to grasp for whatever is possible in life, and to adopt that spirit in Mays. He spent uh, 27 years at Morehouse College teaching uh, African American men in a society that told them that there were great limitations on what they could do. And he taught them that whatever was possible under the sun, that he wanted them to believe that a Morehouse man could accomplish it. And so I want you to adopt that spirit and believe whatever is possible under the sun, that a Benjamin E. Mays, Mays Ray at the Dr. Benjamin Mays Elementary School can accomplish that.